Hi everyone, my name is Maddie. I am the brand lead at Tea Leaves and the Naturex Design Festival Coordinator. It gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone this morning to another session of the Tea Leaves Naturex Design Virtual Festival. The Naturex Design mandate focuses on collaborative approaches across disciplines to offer solutions to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Today, our conversation centers around the mandates of education, access, and diversity of collection, be it contemporary American design or non-native invasive plant species. Uh, now for the topic at hand, I'm so thrilled to dive into the importance of archiving with our expert panelists. At the core of the artifacts that form a museum's original collection or represent a significant event in history, there are inherent biases that place a greater weight on certain sets of knowledge, traditions, and achievements rather than a more holistic and inclusive picture. In the present context of 2020, we are here today to discuss who chooses what is collected and what is forgotten, and how we can better engage communities in storytelling to make the recording process more transparent and personalized. To ponder some of these prompts, we have the immense pleasure of introducing some of our esteemed panelists here today. Um, Emily M. Orr is the Assistant Curator of Modern and Contemporary American Design at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York. Emily holds a PhD in History of Design from the Royal College of Art, Victoria and Albert Museum. Her, exhi her exhibitions at Cooper Hewitt include Botanical Expressions and Underground Modernist, E. McKnight Kofer. Emily M. Orr is the author of Designing the Department Store, Display and Retail at the Turn of the 20th Century. Andy Law is a professor at the Rhode Island School of Design. Recently, Andy was the RISD Industrial Design Department's Graduate Program Director, Subhead of Curriculum, and Davis Fellow for Reflective Teaching. Previously, Andy has worked as the Award Leader of Product Design at Edinburgh College of Art, and as an Interaction Researcher at Goldsmiths, University of London, Royal College of Art, and Interaction Design Institute of Rea, and Digit London. Andrew LeClaire is a graphic designer in New York, working independently on identity, editorial, and interactive projects for clients in publishing, education, the arts, and architecture. He teaches at Parsons, the New School for Design, and Rhode Island School of Design. Previously, Andrew collaborated with Adam Lucas as LeClaire Lucas and was a designer at Project Projects. He holds degrees from RISD and Swarthmore College. Thank you all so much for being here today. And without further ado, I am very excited to get into um, some of the questions that uh, we have put together. Um, so for our panelists, then I'll, I'll start this off as a broad question for anyone to answer. Um, when we're looking at the process of archiving, what does it mean to make archiving more participatory and how do we go about doing that? Well, I think there are a few really exciting ways to crowdsource much more of the archiving process, both in the making of new archives and the interpretation of them, as well as the interpretation of existing material. Like in the museum space, at least, there's a lot more of a two-way dialogue happening between museums and their publics. So there are open calls um, to the public to share their stories, their artifacts, their expertise, but they're also really exciting initiatives that invite the public's participation and in interpretation um, in the way of inscription centers, inviting the public to take part in the process of you know, digesting and sharing archival material. Um, Andy, Andrew, can I, can I get any thoughts from the two of you? I would totally, I mean, I think, yeah, Emily's, Emily's right. I also think that there's, you know, there's interesting examples of uh, not just the general public, but also like artists and researchers and people engaging directly with the collection. Um, just an example is like, I worked uh, with the RISD Museum and they had this amazing archive of etchings, 18th century or 19th century etchings. And they invited uh, like artists who are part of the kind of RISD network to kind of come and make prints like remake prints and sort of experiment with those uh, archi archival etchings. And I think that's like a really interesting model too, or ways of kind of like re reactivating the, you know, this, these amazing archives that exist. 
Um, I suppose what, what I'm thinking about is, um, is, is, is kind of before the, is, is what gets put into the archive in the first place. It's, it's, is more, um, well, not more important, but that's a really important thing. If you're trying to make a an archive participatory, it's like the, the content in the first place needs to be considered. Like, how do you, or maybe I suppose that is making it participatory. It, it's the creation of the archive, not just the way that it's used afterwards. Um, that's one thing that I've been thinking about is uh, in terms of like community uh, groups, how do you make, how do you get them involved in the creation of evidence or artifacts that go into archives? That's kind of what I've been thinking about. Right, it's like empowering people to either bring new interpretations to archival material, like what Andrew's saying, you know, inviting the use of archives in new ways, but also it's like empowering people to um, contribute and think of the history around them and their daily experience as um, noteworthy and, and, and worthy of, of holding onto and sharing. That is fascinating. I think when I think of archives, I always think about an event that is, has occurred in the past and that people may or may not have artifacts from or memories from um, and how participation could be inviting people to uh, reflect on those things that already occurred, but it could also be a participatory outlook on sort of what's happening now. But in that sense, how do we know sort of what is of value or what we should be archiving if we're kind of trying to involve the public in a conversation that is happening at this very moment? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question that I would like Emily to answer. It's like, how do we convince uh, museums and archives to collect things? Um, well, that's the question. How do we convince you that this is important? I know that with um, current protests that they, and also the pandemic, the response to the pandemic, museums and archives seem to have agreed somehow that this is worth collecting. So they're, they're actively collecting things that are happening right now, but normally they don't do that. So what, do, what does Emily think? Um, well, I think something really exciting that's happening is that typically history moves along and museums move in a slower capacity to collect history. But when the historic moment of today is so important, so impactful, connects with so many people and the audiences want to see that story being told in the museum space, the museum pr procedure of collecting things has had to quicken, has had to be reactive. So rapid response collecting initiatives have crept up. And so it's current events are causing this sea change in the way that museums are collecting pieces in order to catch up and um, invite participation and tell those stories that are so important to the contemporary moment. Yeah, I would I would say that's true. And I think it's, it's important to kind of acknowledge that right now is like a challenging time for a lot of museums because of the, you know, because of the, the pandemic has resulted in a lot of museums, you know, closing for many months. And that has put a lot of financial strain on a lot of institutions, but it at the same time has also shifted a lot of the institutional focus to the digital initiatives and the ways that mm -hmm. collections are, you know, archived digitally suddenly becomes this amazing asset. Like all of these institutions have invested a lot of uh, effort over the last, like, say, decade, five years in making their collections digitally um, accessible. And I think now is kind of this moment where suddenly all that investment sort of can be, you know, can be made into something. And yeah, so I think that's like an interesting, particularly also interesting question, not just the, the active archiving of things that are happening now, but then what is that? How does that shift the relationship that audiences have to the collection that already has been archived and is, is there just waiting? But I also think like, the one other thing I wanted to mention is that like on this question of museums sort of archiving things, it can also create some interesting um, kind of challenges like the, the Whitney recently ran into a situation where they archived a lot of artists work uh, that were springing out of the protests in New York. And, you know, it created 
the, the way that they acquired some of those pieces was a little bit um, criticized. Right. It created some interesting questions about, you know, like if the museum is sort of digitally acquiring a work that was that was you know made available online, like what is the how do we look at that kind of transaction, um, and how do we like adjust our expectations around that? Exactly. Yeah, acquisition processes are also really changing, and when you open up the dialogue and ask for donations and go about um, kind of acquiring a broader story, policies, you know, come into question sometimes. And um, certainly there are ethical concerns with all of that as well, but very exciting opportunities. I, I think that's very interesting. Are there, are there current policies in place for sort of the collection of um, artifacts or memories that are more that are first and foremost in that digital realm rather than in the physical because the documentation of the protests and everything that's happening in New York right now and all over the world is something that for many reasons because we can't be going to physical spaces or interacting with physical objects for health and safety reasons, but also because of this digital age that we're in. Um, it seems really important that those questions are being asked. No, definitely. I, I think a lot of that is happening digitally. And there are even, you know, websites being made to archive and document the current moment. And all of that is a digital object in itself that then has to be archived. Um, a colleague and friend of mine created a website called Design in Quarantine that tracked designers' response to the current moment that is now being archived, I believe, by the Victoria and Albert Museum as an object in and of itself. So there's this meta process of archiving the archive. Yeah. Um, Andy, I'm, I'm curious to know, because you work with the city of Boston on um, some public projects in design and community engagement, how sort of um, locally designing or archiving community uh, projects versus sort of in the internet um, much more widely rather than a small community of focus group of people, how the, those two things differ, if that makes any sense at all. Oh, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> um, I, I think I was wondering, sort of, when we look at something like a community within the city of Boston and archiving yeah. efforts or participatory archiving efforts within that small group versus trying to capture everything that's going on in the internet surrounding COVID-19, for example, how those two kind of approaches to being participatory differ. Oh, um, I, I'm not sure about when I when I started this particular bit of research, I was um, looking at community groups, um, you know, in real life, and um, one of my observations was that they generally don't um, document things apart from the final output. So that was my big observation, and I, when we all kind of went into lockdown, my assumption was that all of that i was i immediately thought oh this might be the moment where they start to document everything because their conversations their thoughts that would all be happening digitally um and so i asked um a couple of people from the new urban mechanics which is the boston mayor's you know research group um if they'd seen any of this activity and and they seemed to at that point this was a few months ago i haven't asked again but at that point they were saying oh no it doesn't seem to have shifted online it just seems to have kind of stopped so i was surprised by that because i expected it to move into a more digital format which would have been great because we could have then collected that um i suppose and and then other people could look at it and bang knock their ideas around but is that answering your question? I don't think it's happened, but maybe that was a couple of months ago I asked and I haven't found examples of it specifically. Um. Sure, I, I think um, maybe I'll jump off that into uh, 
slightly more directed question, um, which is sort of evaluating audiences. I think we, we've we mentioned a bit community groups versus artists that are involved in archiving versus um, the collectors themselves. And so I wonder um, how do we evaluate the audience for an archive as we collect um, memories or physical artifacts? And I'll open that up to anyone there. I mean, I, ahead, Andrew. I was gonna say, I think it's interesting that sometimes we don't know like what should be that that there's a there's a question of whether you should make decisions up front about what to archive like if you should try to predict what is going to be interesting or if you should try to capture everything you know i think that's kind of a question for people who are really like inside museums thinking about like what what can be archived I and mean, there's a there's a you know there's a certain amount of work that has to go into just keeping the archive alive so the more that you put into it the more that you, the more work you have to do to keep it accessible right so you know i think of things like uh you know on the internet there's been a lot of interesting circumstances like these online communities like geocities that are these incredible repositories of of like human activity that happened like when the internet was kind of forming but required so much investment by, you know, like Yahoo to basically keep running. And then there have been great projects by artists and organizations like Rhizome to try to capture a lot of that material. So I think in a way, like um, when you're doing that, it's probably better to try to capture as much of it as you can and then allow different narratives to be told through that material. Maybe it's, maybe it's almost like you can I think one way of approaching it is you actually just wait on the audience question and you try to, you try to yeah, get everything that you can. But I think that that also has like a cost associated with it. Yeah, it's one of the best challenges of archiving. You know, how do you balance collecting the ephemeral of the moment and then something that will have a more long-term lasting effect? And I think in the way of design, at least, um, you know, looking at, objects that have had great impact and design stories that have great impact on our daily lives. You know, audience members and researchers want to be able to relate to the stories that we tell. So I think that's a key um, factor for sure. And thinking about how people relate to material in different types of ways and learn in different ways, um, whether it's visually or, or hearing or listening to the material. Is there a is there a kind of audience that's missing at the moment? Do you think for archives? I think you know, I, like as as was mentioned earlier, like you know, as a designer, I always am thinking about how to make these things accessible. I think there's a question of like the interface and how the interface requires a lot of literacy in basically navigating a very complex database. And I wonder if that is, you know, a barrier to entry for a lot of people, you know? And it's, it's certainly like a way of thinking about information that that's, yeah, I think privilege is a certain way of thinking about what the archive is. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good question to ask and something we should think about when yeah, presenting these like large digital collections, like how, what that prioritizes, like I know at the Cooper Hewitt, there have been efforts to make the collection tagged by things other than sort of traditional metadata, which is, I think, an interesting strategy, like in that direction. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's it's a really interesting initiative. You know, Cooper Hewitt digitized the vast majority of its collection a number of years ago, and now that all of those objects and their data have gone onto our collections website, the need is to provide multiple entry points to the collection. So that could be by color. It could be by theme, it could be by curatorial choice. Um, but ideally, the collections website would also serve a very particular researcher who has high level advanced search searches to do, who's seeking a totally different type of information than someone just curiously browsing. So being able to meet all of these needs with one interface, whether it's an online collection or an exhibition, is a challenge for sure. Yes, and it seems like that's kind of one of the exciting 
opportunities when the collection is digitized because you're not limited to like one particular mode of presentation. You know, like in, in a traditional museum, you have your exhibition space and you have your exhibition catalog. And that often is the, the two primary ways that you can see the collection. And it's really interesting, like what you're saying, Emily, that we can't have one interface that solves everything. So it's actually opens up this opportunity that we can have many different kinds of interfaces, which are different ways of looking at that same collection data and pulling out different aspects or, you know, emphasizing certain things or approaching it in a different way. I think that's a really interesting yeah. opportunity for. No, it's true. I, I like um, Google Arts and Culture. You know, you can take a selfie and then they find a painting, a, por a painting of you that looks like you. It's always, I like that as an interface because it's kind of, it's funny, you know, it's just funny. And it's, uh, I think a lot of people have used that who just never would go anywhere near an archive usually. Um, but it's still a very limited audience, you know. Uh, no, it's but, true. And you're someone who would never find that painting or sculpture otherwise, only found it through this cool tool that takes all the yeah. data of the collection and does something entirely different with it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, do, I do like that as an example of accessibility. Because it's well, you know, it's a little bit weird, and I like things that are a little bit weird. But could could we ask Andrew what his project is about at the new museum? Because I think that that, yeah. that is something I'm quite interested about, and I and I've I read a little bit about it, but I thought, sorry, Madeleine, I'm stealing your. Go on, Andrew, tell me about your project quick. Sure. So just to briefly introduce that, um, I. I am right now a member of New Inc, which is a cultural incubator um, affiliated with the New Museum. And I'm part of a track, a program track there that is funded by the Knight Foundation. And the goal is to research new technology, technological approaches that could help museums um, working with their collection and engaging audiences. And I think kind of what I was just saying, it really relates to what I'm working on, which is having worked as a graphic designer a lot with museums over the last you know, five, 10 years, one of the challenges that I've, I've experienced is that museums have generated so much data that like great writing, great, all this metadata about objects, but it's just actually the, the bottleneck ends up being the person who kind of needs to manually package that in a way that can go to an audience. And so the, the practical kind of question is, well, are there better design tools that we can use to take all of this amazing data and writing and things that exist within museums and create ways of programmatically uh, assembling them into artifacts that can be shared with people. So an example right now, we're working on a prototype in collaboration with uh, the RISD Museum, which is in Providence, as a teaching art museum. And so there's room to be a little more experimental. And so we're trying to do something, a very simple kind of prototype of this idea by building uh, exhibition checklists that can appear in multiple formats. So instead of like, it's a very small internal team, they can essentially take the list of all the objects from the collection database and then output it in various ways. So it can be print, it can be digital, it can reach people like across many different platforms. And also can make that information more accessible. Um, so we can make like a large print version. You know, we can we can change the, the visualization of that data very easily. And so that's the goal is that, you know, like I was kind of saying, alluding to earlier, now that museums, we have all this content, right? It's actually sort of up to design in some sense to like find ways of pulling that out and making it digestible and legible um, and accessible and distributable and all of those things by, by people. So that's kind of the, that's sort of the, the central question of the research that I'm doing there. I think that's so exciting, something that's digestible, but exciting um, and, and accessible, allow people to, I don't know, see the narrative of an exhibition in a very kind of boiled down way that also provides a lot of information. And I think like the, yeah. the, the eventual like ideal, which I think connects to your interests Andy, and like questions that you're asking are like, you know, once these tools are created, 
they should probably not be just for museums, right? Like they can be things that people not in the museum can use for their own purposes, you know, that like, if you make your own archive, you should be able to, you know, make essentially like a catalog of that archive or, you know, distribute it in various ways. So your tool is, could be, um, it, could, it could enable me to do what Emily does in some respects. I could curate an exhibition and I could select things um, and I can say that I selected those things to mean something. I have a message in my curation. This is, this is my, this is what I think you do, Emily. I'm not, maybe I got it wrong, but. You got it right. <laughs> so I, I wonder I'm, also. Sorry, go on, I, okay. just, I, I wonder also, Andy, if there's a potential for, I don't know, a checklist of objects or memories in the work that you do and the material that you, you know, create with the communities you work with. Well, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm just thinking I could steal Andrew's right. uh, project and then we just, well, I mean, it's not steal. I'm presuming that Andrew is going to make these tools and that all we can do then is select, we'll be able, part of your tools will be choosing the archive that you're going to reference because there's no limit to how many archives you can pull from, I imagine. You can, so I could pull from the Museum of Modern Art and I can also pull from the, um, I, I forgot the name of it, but the Brooklyn Community Garden, I think it's called. Um, so, you know, yeah, that I think what's, nice what's so exciting about opportunities like that is to create connections across collections too, or within a big collection, you know, the thousands of objects that the RISD Museum holds, how can we show how they're interconnected? or across institutions, like Andy is saying. Yeah. Or, or how, how we think they're connected. It, you know. Right, personally. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I think that, you know, if, if essentially the ability to hire a designer privileges those people who have the ability to hire a designer, right, to make a catalog or something, right? I think the, the, yeah, the potential is that it can open up yeah, opportunities for intervention into and, and sort of curation within existing collections or connections across collections, but also, you know, like essentially personal archiving or like community archiving that doesn't require, you know, like a huge digital initiatives budget. Right. I mean, I think about Instagram and how everyone is archiving their daily experience on such a regular basis now. It encourages this very reflective practice. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention, going back to this question, uh, Andy, that you brought up of like taking a selfie and then seeing a object in a collection. I think that's the other exciting opportunity, which is like very, like very new kinds of pathways through the collections. So I wanted to mention one of my colleagues at New Inc is doing a really interesting project called Lineage that started uh, as a kind of machine learning research where it looks at all the different images, but it looks at them visually. So instead of being kind of like by color, it really looks at like the overall composition and sort of forms in the image. And so it can create these really amazing visual connections across the collection from, you know, across time periods or across disciplines, you know, so you can have a piece of like a dress that looks like a painting. And I think it's really interesting to imagine, yeah, like new ways like that of, of browsing across and making connections. Sounds great. So that operates by shape then, or form. And yeah, I think it's a little bit, um, I don't really understand fully how it works. <laughs> yeah, it does some, it does some yeah. sophisticated image pattern matching so that it, yeah, pulls out kind of like distinctive visual features. And so it, right. yeah, it, it's, it's very, it's very, like, it, it feels like images that you would intuitively relate to each other rather than images mm -hmm. I think you just have to believe in it Emily That's... I believe in it I'm excited to see it yeah <laughs> Tell me. Well, I think everyone is very visually conscious and we have a very visually conscious audience at museums and cultural institutions and I think that kind of image association and seeing connections across history time periods geographies is 
becoming more and more encouraged and tools that can help us, you know, interpret data and find those connections are great. I think um, the, the weaving of archives, as I understand it, or the fact that you could draw from this digital archive and this digital archive in order to kind of um, create your own mosaic that is significant to you is really interesting. And I wonder in, in terms of accessibility and, and access to museums at a time like this, but also just for the barriers to entry that exist to going to visit a physical museum, even when there isn't a global pandemic, um, whether this is a really interesting kind of like open source learning platform or like, I don't want to say a computer game, but there is this kind of lower barrier to entry that could engage people that might not necessarily find themselves browsing museum archives to, to put together a collage of things that are important to them. And whether you see kind of any education institutions or museums looking to do that type of programming right now. Well, I think the idea of turning the archive on its head is really exciting and opening it up to um, new interpretation. I, an example that comes to mind is um, the Design Museum in London, when they reopened, they asked their audiences what objects they wanted to see in the Design Museum and then encouraged them on what they called this crowdsourced wall. And so people's cho top choices made the cut and were exhibited in this kind of um, you know, institutional structure of the museum. So it turned the hierarchy on its head. And um, I like that kind of thinking. And in terms of archives, you know, we think of them as these boxed up um, kind of staid, um, quiet, dead repositories of information. And I think the most that we can do to make them sync with other objects of our collections and experiences, the better, so that they're not these isolated, you know, repositories of knowledge. Yeah, exactly. There was a there was a exhibition at uh, RISD that was curated by Andy Warhol, where he called mm -hmm. Radio Box, where he went into the collection and pulled all of this. You know, he pulled the kind of metal screens that the paintings were just stored on in the in the kind of archival storage, and then just took the arrangement of the paintings and then just put them into the, the kind of exhibition space. But I think it's interesting. Now RISD is doing a new project where they've invited a bunch of different uh, artists and groups to do essentially the same project. And what's cool about that is that any moment in time where you look at a collection and you pull out things of significance, ha like creates a new interpretation at that moment. And that itself is really worth archiving. And I think that like, it gives a lot of meaning to in a way, it gives a lot of additional layers of meaning that like at that moment, this is what you chose to archive. This is what was important or this, this is what made sense as a collection. Yeah, at Cooper Hewitt, we have a program called Collection Selects where we invite um, uh, someone in the creative industries, um, most often a writer, a thinker, um, a digital entrepreneur to pick objects from the collection and they work with a curator to put together a small show. So I've worked with Ellen DeGeneres I worked with um, Bob Greenberg of the digital firm RGA in New York and um, some really exciting like new voices being brought to the collection, new audiences. That is fascinating. Is, is there ever when someone is kind of curating their own collection of the collection um, opportunities for the public to possibly put use their own storytelling or their own memories of the types of events that are being showcased to then sort of further archive on top of the archive um, and kind of like round tables about a specific moment or a specific exhibition and the memories that it brings up for other people and um, do those then kind of get re-filtered back into the collection for for further archives. I think that sounds like a great <laughs> set of possible programs. Um, at Cooper Hewitt, we've had something that integrates with like the physical experience of being in the museum. So we have digital tables and a pen that is a digital pen that allows the visitor to collect objects 
as they walk around the galleries. So in that way, they're creating their own archive of that experience that they had at the museum that day. And those can then be shared out and used a lot by teachers to assemble objects to share with their classes. Um, so it's both kind of practical and, and personal. Andy, last we spoke, we were um, speaking about Google Photos as almost a, a personal and accessible tool that a lot of people use as an introductory to, hey, I have my own archive and I'm able to splice my own memories based on a person's face or um, a year at a time. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to comment on some of the thoughts that you shared there. Um, yeah, well, I think that what I'm, what I'm thinking about in my, just right now in my head is relates to that. It's like, how do you, do you, I suppose it's in the form of a question to Emily and Andrew is, do you think that archives teach people how, what is something that is archivable? It's like, how do you teach, because everybody's taking photographs and creating all of this stuff, but is that archivable? Is it worthy of archiving or is it good? Um, or is the, the process that they used is that a, is that a good one? So I'm thinking of community groups. It's it's almost like they don't create evidence of their process because currently, well, some of them don't. So they just currently don't think that that's valuable. But I think when they start seeing it, that oh, here's an archive, and here's how it's getting used, they would suddenly think, oh, it's actually worth taking photographs of everything and all of those ideas which we didn't use that they would be good to share because somebody else might find them valuable is is this is my thoughts it's not it's a question do you think i suppose archives are teaching people how to archive aren't they as well i guess i would say um i don't know if this totally answers your question andy but uh but and I noticed there were some questions in the, the chat that were asking about, you know, like whether whether sort of archiving like within the context of the museum or like on platforms like Instagram is like the only is like a is a valid form of archiving or the only kind of archiving we should consider. I mean, for me personally, I actually think that sort of other forms of archiving, partly because I'm a graphic designer, I you know, will always believe in sort of the book or like print as a format because it's so durable and you know engaging. It has longevity. And so I think in some ways, like all of these digital initiatives, I think we should also think about because they require so many resources to keep, you know, running, alternative ways of kind of pulling things out of the archive or storing archives that actually will have longevity. I mean, we broke risk before the call, we were talking about a project that I did a number of years ago where it would allow people to capture all of their Twitter data, pull it off of the platform and actually put it into a book that you could then put on your shelf and will actually still be accessible in 10 years. And I think you know, we should also think about, you know, forms of kind of taking archives offline or removing things from the archive to personally keep them because I think that's a way that they can have, you know, more, you're not, you're not as you're not as reliant on the on the sort of infrastructure of the institution or of the, the tech company. Yeah, I think something interesting that's happening in the museum space overall is that we all like the sense of kind of being in know in the know and getting the behind the scenes story. And so museum processes are sometimes or hopefully more so in the future will be made more and more transparent. So for instance, the conservation of an object happening in the center of a gallery or what we call open storage, you know, a glass room filled with um, highlights from the collection that the visitor can get quite close to um, in a safe way, still protected behind glass, but kind of opening up that collection. And I think I am looking forward to finding ways to exhibit archives that bring that sense of discovery and um, to the visitor and make it available to them. And like Andrew is saying, finding um, better physical solutions into how to integrate archival material into exhibitions and make them a part of a larger 
story. Um, at Cooper Hewitt, we put a lot of emphasis on design process. So we have a lot of archives by major designers like Henry Dreyfus, Donald Jeske, um, Walter von Nessen that show us how the designers made these objects. So one of the things that I love doing is pairing design sketches um, and preparatory drawings with a final product to tell that more complete story. Andy, I can sense that this is percolating for you. Do you have any? Uh... <laughs> I was thinking I want to go and see, I've never heard Emily mention the design process thing. So that sounds really interesting. I'd like to see Definitely. that. Definitely. I mean, we're so grateful to designers who left us their materials and saved things that um, leave us like those hints of understanding and creative innovation. Yeah. like a prototype that um, might have just been built in an afternoon or a design drawing on a napkin. <laughs> you know, we're, we're happy for those insights into the design process that we would not otherwise have were it not for the archive. Um, and grateful to designers, to our point earlier about active archiving, who actually archived their work and, um, you know, gave it to a, a cultural institution that could care for it and make it accessible and share those stories. What are things that like um, artists or designers or just everyday people who are not artists or designers, but are just, you know, going about their life, like what could or should they do to make that, I don't know, the, the traces of their life like more, more archivable, you know, like what are the things that people don't think to save that are actually the things ultimately that are most valuable? Yeah, that's a great question. I know, I think of oral history and just telling those stories and recording them about the daily experience as being um, a really accessible way that we can collect our experience um, and hold on to it. But valuing history and the objects around you, we can certainly empower and encourage. Right, you were mentioning like one of our earlier conversations, just the, the backgrounds of, of Zoom, like conversations or photographs that just happen to include many objects like are actually really valuable archival, archival things, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's this kind of secondary use for documenting our home office spaces or wherever we happen to be when we're on the call. And I imagine historians, I mean, they already are. I've, I've seen a few articles in the design space about this, but what a resource if archived these conversations could be for the future. We did um, within the sort of tea leaves department with um, as sort of a prototype project at the start of COVID asked some of our design friends to show us their work from home spaces and talk about the sort of um, objects on their desks or the books that they read or the rituals that they go through every day to help them maintain creativity and work collaboratively with their teams um, within COVID and um, I'm now thinking as a part two to this, it would be really fascinating to have um, the March, April um, self-filming and then now going into sort of September, October, November, the, um, the secondary look at that to see how people's spaces have changed, but also how their outlooks and their strategies have changed as well. I think that's a great idea. You can get more of the arc of the experience. Thank you all so much. That was incredibly insightful and so fascinating to listen to. Um, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank Emily, Andy, and Andrew for their time today um, in sort of educating us on how we can re-examine and reflect on our history for the future and that history is being documented and created right now and that we um, are welcomed to engage and be a part of that story. So thank you all so much and thank you everyone for joining. 